So welcome everyone to this session on industrial sustainability. And we are going to take a, a specific angle to the topic today, which is uh, how sustainability can be actually turned into a competitive advantage. May you can well follow what we are saying. We are talking in English, so that's your channel too. Uh, there are translators backstage. If you want to listen to it in French, you can switch to channel one. My name is Sophie Bourne. I'm with Schneider Electric. I am the president of our water segment. And I am here with four fabulous hosts for this panel, uh, representing different sectors of the industry. So Stéphane is from ArcelorMittal, so uh, a very uh, big European worldwide uh, steel manufacturer. Uh, Kunal is from uh, Glencore and a specific business unit in Glencore, which is recycling. We are going to hear more about that in a minute. Georg is from Willow, which is one of, of the major pump manufacturers and, well, have extended their business beyond pumps. And Stefano uh, is uh, from an uh, Italian water utility called Padania Acque, uh, so from the, the water business. Uh, The reason why we are here talking uh, about sustainability is that, well, we all represent different sectors of the industry that are critical to the society. Uh, we are all in companies that are corporate citizens, so to say. Uh, and of course, the impact of uh, all industries combined is accounting to um, one third, one fifth, depending on how you are counting. So, but we have a big impact on the overall greenhouse gas emission. So we have a big responsibility when it comes to that. Uh, but what we are going to explore today again is how we can turn it into a business advantage. Thinking about it, I was reflecting uh, on how a few decades ago, you know, lean manufacturing was introduced to focus on quality. Uh, and it was probably uh, a constraint at the very beginning. But lean manufacturing turned out to be a big competitive advantage and chasing waste had an immediate impact on uh, profitability as well. I do see the sustainability journey being a bit similar. Of course, uh, there is uh, the responsibility around sustainability that we all embrace. But when we do it, we are uncovering a lot of uh, advantage, well, impact on our bottom lines, competitive advantage. And this is what we are going to, to discuss So let me uh, start by asking each of you how your own company is um, defining sustainability. What is sustainability to you? Uh, because in discussing, we have seen that, uh, yes, sustainability is one same world, but we, we all interpret it and translate it in different ways because we are working in different contexts. So let me start by turning to you, Georg. Uh, what does sustainability mean for Willow? Yeah, sustainability means a lot to us. It's even uh, the company is uh, more than 150 years old and it has been in the DNA since since day one. Uh, it's a family-owned business. Uh, we're making 2 billion uh, euro turnover. We have 9,500 uh, people, um, employees uh, employed and uh, we basically are in, in 80 countries in the world. Um, sustainability for us is of a paramount importance and why do I say that? Uh, there's proof... <laughs> We just decided in the in the board of management that sustainability strategy will be the corporate strategy. So our complete company will orientate now on sustainability strategy. Uh, that is to reinforce already what we did before. And then I tell you one one thing why why that is uh, in, in in this case um, when we did the um, um, evaluation for the scope three emission reduction then of course you you need to look what impact do you as a company do you do to the planet um, and i don't know whether you know that 10 percent of the world electrical energy is going into pumps it's probably a surprise to you because pumps you never see they are in the cellar or even hidden or somewhere in the ground you never see them light we see light is also 10 percent of the electrical energy so 10 percent of the world energy is huge but you then assume That's what, what we believe uh, is the fact that pumps are typically long-lasting. They're running for 30 years, 40 years, if you like. Uh, they're not dying quickly. Um, and when you then see what's the installed capacities in the world, 
and then assume that probably 80 to 90% of those pumps are inefficient. So with old technology, not regulated, etc., then you see what huge effect we could have by replacing those pumps with modern ones, which are typically saving 80% of energy because of uh, being electrically uh, controlled, electronically controlled, etc., uh, etc. Et so you see there's a huge impact on that one. Uh, the other part is probably another aspect which we don't have immediately on our list, on our agenda, is that with that part of sustainability is not only electrical uh, energy, it is also the access to drinking water. About 2 billion people in the world do not have access to drinking water. So that's one part where we make sure we get uh, 100 million, that's our actual target right now, and uh, about 200 million is our 2030 target, that we get access, uh, people access to drinking water. And then one further step is food security. Uh, what about pumps and food security? Because I can tell you that a lot of areas need to, to pump water to agriculture. And we have huge projects which we support, for example, in Egypt, where we then enable the people to let them grow uh, corn and, and, and wheat. And I think that is something what, what we see in a wider perspective also as sustainability. And I could go on for an hour, so sorry for that. I, I need to stop now. <laughs> Let me move on to um, a yeah. point you made on water. Yeah. Uh, to turn to you, Stefano, uh, what is the view of Padania Aque as a water utility on sustainability? Yes, thank you. Um, water is our product, and our mission is uh, to ensure um, quality and continuity of service to all our civil and industrial customers. Mm. Uh, uh, referring to industrial customers in particular, to all those customers that use water as a primary input of their production processes. And sustainability uh, for us uh, um, is linked to water leakages. Uh, water leakages are uh, the, the big challenge, not, not only for us, but for uh, all the, the water industry. Uh, losses, water losses impacts on uh, sustainability, resilience, availability, continuity of service, uh, but also finally on profitability. And um, water losses also um, cause environmental problems um, because they represent a waste of a limited source. They cause uh, financial problems due to produced and unbilled water. They cause um, energy problems due to useless um, power consumption in central pumping and also may, may represent a potential damage for person and property. So water loss reduction is a key factor in our uh, sustainability strategy. And uh, we are a best practice in Italy from this point of view. We are able to keep uh, water losses rate under 22% uh, against a, an average, an Italian average of 42, for example. But uh, we are also a good practice in Europe because the, the European average of water losses is 25 mm -hmm. So from water to metal, uh, let me start with you, Kunal. Uh, so you were running the recycling business at Glencore. What is your take on sustainability? Thanks, Sophie. So I think from a Glencore perspective, we are affected by the same themes and macro challenges that I heard Peter talk about yesterday. So I think two things, specifically if I pick on, you know, this concept of a localization that so we're going... We were in globalization, now it increasingly looks like localization. There's this concept of reshoring, um, of course, uh, overlaid with the energy transition and decarbonization theme. So if you look at all of that, how Glencore's looking at the space, our purpose is to responsibly produce, recycle, and supply uh, the key commodities that are needed for advancing everyday life. Um, and a lot of those key commodities increasingly are uh, energy transition commodities like copper, like nickel, like cobalt, lithium. So the way we look at sustainability from the corporate perspective, we are living in an increasingly constrained world. So any raw material you want to pick that's needed for the energy transition is constrained um, under any range of scenarios, uh, whichever model you want to pick. So I guess the fundamental theme is we will need more primary raw materials from mining or other primary sources. 
um, and in that space, Glencore's commitment is to responsibly and sustainably produce more more of these critical metals and materials from our primary business. Uh, and then comes uh, energy efficiency, which is sort of more in Schneider's space and, and, and our spaces. So we've talked about energy is not being efficiently used, so you can have energy efficiency. And I think on an industry level, if you do one and two, you still don't fully close the gap on meeting your net zero targets. That's where I think recycling and circularity plays a role to close that last remaining gap um, because and that's where sort of my business the recycling business falls in um, because if you look at circularity I think it helps you from the localization and the reshoring theme and why is that the case because uh, effectively natural resources are where they are not every country in the world has a nickel cobalt and a lithium mine or a copper mine uh, but if you look at the proverbial urban mine, pretty much any developed economy has a lot of the same raw materials. They are just sitting in the products that you and I use. Yeah, whether it's, it's not waste. It's called waste. But uh, there is a much right. more optimistic right. way to look at it, which is your source of recycling. Correct. So I think first part is you can achieve localization reshoring part of it through having a good circular economy within each region. Second is it helps you with the carbon goals because typically recycled products, recycled metal, recycled raw materials have a substantially lower carbon footprint than um, primary produced materials. And thirdly, to your point earlier, when something's labeled waste, it's more expensive to produce, it's more expensive to move, and likely a lot of it ends up in landfills. So by changing the uh, rhetoric from waste to post-consumer resources, let's say, you also reduce what goes to landfill versus you're actually putting them back into products. So to summarize, that's sort of our view on how we can contribute to the sustainability requirements yeah. uh, of the world going forward. Turning to you, Stefan, for, for the French part of the audience, I think you've all seen uh, Absolo making the headlines uh, of the press uh, for its exemplary investments in sustainability. Uh, but... What does sustainability mean to Arcelor in a more granular way? Yeah, well, uh, industry sustainability is a very important concept. I think it's uh, for us uh, how to make sure that the complete production chain, not just one piece, uh, is uh, more uh, resilient and at the same time less harmful, meaning having less impact on the environment everything. Uh, our product first has very good credentials for that because it can be recycled infinitely and it's at the same time one key lever of the green transition. I think steel is the most used material in uh, wind production, in solar production for all the trackers, uh, but also for all the new infrastructure. If we go more with trains, we'll need more rails. So uh, steel is a lever of the green transition. Uh, so on the on the product side, it's it's quite uh, uh, easy. Uh, on the process side, it's more difficult because since the Stone Age, uh, the man has been melting steel with coal and coal leads to high CO2 emissions. So that's the difficult part for sustainability for us. And this uh, uh, requires a full transformation of our processes. Uh, the good thing, as I said, is that steel itself is recycled. It's recyclable. So we will naturally increase uh, the recycling rate of uh, the, the, the steel we, we, we melt. Um, but we will have to transform completely our processes. That's what you could read in the press. Uh, moving, changing energy, moving from coal to more electrification. So more steel, more, uh, more energy generation. Uh, changing our processes, meaning we will have to scrap all our assets. That's a very difficult and very uh, uh, intensive uh, uh, in terms of uh, finance uh, a change. But we will also need a uh, lot of new raw materials. So that's also what we need to, to transform for the time being. And the last point I would like to mention, it's also the political aspect of the sustainability. Uh, we are in still used to that, but um, transforming, as I said at the beginning, a full supply chain is just not making sure one piece is preserved. I think we have to make sure all the chain is more uh, sustainable. So we are also to ensure that the policy is the same all around the world. So if we have to produce steel with a certain CO2 level in Europe, it has to be the same in other regions. And this is valid for all the materials. You can very easily delocate one of the chain, making it less sustainable in some point, but at the end, the customer doesn't see it. So it's very the political aspects are also quite important in that discussion of industrial sustainability. Absolutely. So 
your hearing that for, for all of us, sustainability is one of the key driver of our strategy, if not the one key driver of our strategies. Um, let's be a bit more practical now and go into what you actually did, how you implemented, what action you've deployed to well execute your sustainability strategy. And let me start with you, Stefano. Uh, so what have you done and implemented at Padena Aque and what is the result you are getting out of it? Okay. Uh, we, we oversee every step of uh, integrated water cycle. Uh, we oversee operation over all uh, the processes uh, from um, capture of water to treatment of wastewater. And uh, we do this uh, in uh, over 100 municipalities Uh, we manage 500 plants and uh, about 5,000 kilometers of pipes. This is a huge and widespread infrastructure that uh, is difficult to manage and to monitor. And so to better manage and monitor this infrastructure, uh, we launched a, a new project in 2018 called the uh, Water Management System, in acronym WMS, And uh, this project had uh, two main pillars, uh, one SCADA-based and the other pillar was IoT technology-based. Um, all the project is enabled by EcoStructor Water Cycle Advisor, that is a, it's a Schneider technology, uh, in particular with two modules, one called Water Loss and one other called Water Simulation. Um, the SCADA is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. It's a next generation telemetry system with uh, advanced features of all plants, um, working uh, as an integration of the pre existing remote control system. And um, it, um, it, it connects all plants to a sole control room, so we are able to control all plants 24 hours per day. It processes water balances. It suggests uh, prioritization of intervention and also um, delivers standard dashboard and reports for the management. Uh, the IoT technologies instead are dedicated uh, to water distribution network. Um, we placed uh, smart sensors and smart meter in uh, strategic points of the network Um, to districti distric districtize the network and close water balances. And um, all the smart devices um, collects data about flow and pressure and also on customer consumption data to an hydraulic model. And the hydraulic model is able to pre-localize water losses and uh, to uh, module central pumping pressures and flows on the basis of real-time demand. The, this uh, enable to not maintain an high pressure in pipes ever, but uh, to uh, module pumping on the basis of real-time demand. This uh, obviously preserves pipes and reduce power consumption. Um, can, can you share some figures? Because they are impressive. We, we gained the... Um, very satisfactory results. Uh, we do this for environment, but also for profitability. Uh, our profitability really rose up. Within the last five years, EBITDA um, grow, um, increased by 73%, per, um, 73% and um, power consumption reduced by uh, 16%. So in this way, with this project, we are more sustainable and we create also value for our shareholders and stakeholders. And what I actually find very uh, interesting in the water industry is that the, the volume of water that is lost through leaks is actually called non-revenue water. So you can yes. see the link to your bottom line very, very yes. directly. Uh, so you have a double stake to be yes. pursuing reduction of leaks, reduction of non-revenue water. And the results that uh, you just shared over the last five years is a great testimony to what actually action can deliver. Yes. You, you have great results already, but you are still continuing your journey. Can you give us a peak view on what's coming next? Um, we will continue to invest uh, in this direction. Now we are uh, 
I can I can speak about two two projects. One is uh, in evaluation phase. It's called Sido uh, Noise Logger. Uh, it's a data technology, and um, it uh, is able to improve the capability of WMS of our system to detect um, water losses and also its precision. Uh, it's based on uh, of the noise uh, of uh, water pipes. Uh, the other project is uh, in execution phase. Uh, is a performance measurement project, uh, in particular sustainability performance measurement. Um, we are trying to to measure um, the CO2 uh, emission reduction uh, for each liter of uh, water saved, uh, and also uh, the CO2 emission reduction linked to the introduction of WMS system. Because you can't fix what you don't see, so keeping monitoring and yes. improving is going to continue to uh, well help you at least keep this excellent level of performance and get it to the to the next level. Thank you very much for, for sharing. Stefano, turning to Stefan. Uh, what about ArcelorMittal? What are some actions that uh, you can share to give a taste to the audience of uh, what can actually be done? Yeah. Uh, it, it, for us, it's really depending on the markets in which we're active. Uh, and here too, policy has a very important role to play. Uh, for instance, we see in construction, there is a lot of demand for uh, more sustainable products. Uh, clearly, the product carbon footprint of the buildings of all new constructions uh, is, a, is a criteria for decision uh, of awarding the businesses. So we see in that, uh, in that sector a very a strong request for, for low carbon materials. We have also, as I mentioned before, the energy segment, which is really demanding. I think we cannot produce uh, renewable energies with windmills which have a poor CO2 footprint. That doesn't sound well. So it's, uh, it's also a very strong segment. But we also see now all the public markets which are starting to move. And indeed, public authorities have also a role to play in giving a, an example in how to buy a greener. And we see that for all new tenders, for bridges, for ra railroads, uh, highways, that, uh, that we get more and more uh, requests for, uh, for, uh, for green, greener products. Uh, all these segments are very still intensive, so the price still matters. But at the end, uh, except for the public tenders, in the other segments that I mentioned, uh, the customer are able to transfer uh, the additional cost of the more decarbonized product to the end consumers because this has a value for all the chain. So this is what we need to all look for, making sure that it brings a real value to the end customer and then all the chain is able to transfer the, the over cost of, uh, of more sustainable products. So we are probably part of your niche market, but Schneider exactly. is a customer. If you look at all the electrical cabinets, there is, uh, well, it's, they are made out of steel. Uh, and, well, we are launching one that is somewhere behind over there uh, that we call a decarbonized enclosure because uh, the steel industry is transforming and is, well, helping us to decarbonize our product with decarbonized steel. So exactly. there are many virtuous cycles being developed between the different industries towards sustainability and that's very interesting. And, and sorry, this is a very good example because this is one of the first uh, steel and applications which is done with 100% green electricity yeah. and uh, recycled scrap. So it's one of the most virtuous products we can find on the market. So turning to, to you to close this loop on an uh, example of execution. So. Sure, so I think from maybe I'll cover what it means from a Glencoe perspective yep. and for our, our customers. So yep. I think my view, you know, sustainable business is good, profitable business. Our recycling circular economy business contributes about 250, 200, 250 million to Glencore EBITDA. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's new business. That's, that's not uh, at yeah. all to be paid to be sustainable. That's right. a great business yeah, opportunity. So highly profitable. Uh, in fact, some, uh, we recently took all uh, all our analysts on a tour of our recycling assets and they they suggest that this could be a billion dollar EBITDA business by the end of the century, as a decade, sorry. So, A, it's a profitable business, it's good business and it's profitable. From what it means, similar themes as what, what Stefan mentioned, if you look at our customers, what is the attractiveness and what is the value proposition for them? Recycled copper, for example, generally has 80% lower carbon footprint. Uh, increasingly, that's very interesting fact for our, our customers. In consumer electronics, for example, a lot of people we work with increasingly are making pledges to use recycled metal. Uh, some companies are saying 100% recycled. 
uh, metals by 2030. Uh, we were one of the founding members of what's called the Circular Electronics Partnership, which basically aims to get electronics to be 100% circular by 2030. So it's, you know, recycled content or lower carbon footprint, product carbon footprint is not just a sustainable theme. It's also an important marketing tool. People actually care about these alongside form and function. So it's a third thing uh, that sits next to form and function and is an important marketing tool, which is now recognized by OEMs. Uh, I would also say from a cost perspective, um, from a circular business model perspective, you can shorten your supply chains by having more localized closed loops. So that goes to your bottom line in terms of your security of supply, shorter supply chains, less disruption. Um, so I think from that perspective, our goal is to create these circularity platforms by region, definitely North America, Europe, catering to both the electronics industry, the electrification, the EV, ESS industry. Uh, and this is all very impactful, both in terms of any measure of sustainability as well as profitability. When, if we talk about US, US has a, a big program to reshore industries yep. in the US. Uh, part of it is a Made in America program. Yep. Uh, we do see Intel and other building builds uh, chips right. uh, factories yep. in the U.S. How do you find raw material in the U.S. Right. while well, through recycling? So that's a, a great virtual cycle as well. Yeah, it definitely is. Thank you. And then, so thank you for, for these uh, examples of uh, real action. Uh, before I turn to the audience for questions, and because we are at a Schneider Electric Innovation Summit, let's talk a bit about technology. Um, how do you see the role of uh, digital and electric, which was uh, the opening tagline of uh, our Innovation Summit? How do you see the role of these technologies into the actions that you are driving? How is that helping you? What can we do different or, or more to continue to help you? Uh, if I may I, give you, that, that answer, then, uh, uh, Sophie. Um, I think what, when you ask also the question of what have we done in the last years and decades uh, as a company, then I think we went through the electrification first, where we saved 80% of energy. Then we went through the electronification and control era, let's say, where we also saved a lot of energy. Now, the next step is then to see not only a component as a, as a fact, let's say, what you can uh, make more efficient, but you think in systems. So basically, there is the moment when building automation is coming in mm -hmm. or whatever, also for sewage plants, the same story, um, that you control a number of, of devices, in our case, then pumps. So step by step, Efficiency is that what we what we gain from the market, uh, let's say, and, and from the initiatives. Um, we are a company who's, who's pioneering for you. This is our claim. So basically, innovation is the the uh, how should they say the cornerstone of that one. Their innovation technology is coming together to save the planet mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And now going forward, what is the next step? Next step is AI. We're already playing with AI, uh, let's say, around where you say, okay, that what man cannot handle anymore, the machine can do, even with the flood of data, what we can use. And we see also uh, already efficiency gains in factories, but we also will use that also for, for predictive maintenance. You all know that, that stuff, what is then coming. I, I think there is another step change coming to us in that perspective. Um, and... So therefore, your question about digitalization, yes, we need that, definitely. Uh, it's a matter of, uh, let's say, time and scalability in the market because not every market is ready for that. It's also, I mean, the mature markets are further advanced than the emerging markets in that one, but we might do some step changes there as well. And actually, uh, the data architecture was somehow underlying all the actions that you took, Stefano, with all the solutions that you cite were actually digital solutions. Yeah. What about you, Stefan, in terms of uh, automation, digitali digitalization, digitization, whatever is the appropriate English word, turning digital? Yeah. Well, we're often seen as a very conservative industry, but I will give you just a few examples to show it's not the case. Uh, first of all, all our lines are so complex that uh, they have been fully automatized. We have sensors everywhere, 
and we have been one of the first industrial company setting its own 5G network in France just to collect the millions of data we get every day. Uh, our plants uh, are now fully uh, automatically controlled, also uh, thanks to a use of IA, because, as I mentioned before, the management of the resources for us is key. Uh, a small plant uses almost one tera terawatt hour uh, per year, Uh, energy, it's huge, and every saving that we do is important, and it also helps to control the process parameters. But we also, for instance, uh, uh, use drones to uh, to control our, our uh, stocks. That's uh, that's uh, that's another example. And uh, in terms of maintenance, to give a, th a last one, uh, we have fully digitalized some of our plants. We are in process of doing that for all the plants, so that we can do maintenance operations off-site to repeat first to ensure better safety to make sure we have the right spare, spare parts before, before going there. So these are three examples that show that uh, we can do a lot of, also in heavy industries with, uh, with automation and digitalization. Which is typically what we will call uh, while building a digital twin to exactly. do simulation and even to use it for training purposes. Absolutely. Uh, where the real line is too critical to be actually used for, for training and that's... Production and... Uh, yes, absolutely. Yep. Kunada? Sure. So uh, maybe I'll just take an industry point of view. So three things I would think is from a circularity lens. So we still are not good at designing products for circularity. It's catching on, but it's not there. So we design products for form and function. We don't de design them to be easy to recycle or mm. or put back into reuse. Uh, so I think digitization, digital trend should play a role in design of design for circularity. Yep. Uh, it's a it's a growing field and very important. That's the first point. Second, I would say is um, the end of life of those products and how you recycle is still very dated technology. Um, and I think we need to, as this progresses, you, you you're gonna go away from recycling to unmanufacturing, and that means taking products apart using robotics, AI, intelligent uh, mm -hmm. dream unmanufacturing concepts versus just shredding them in a crude way and and try to use a whole bunch of mechanical processes to then extract metals. I think automation will play a role. Robotics, AI will play a role in unmanufacturing. Third thing, going back to the concept that a lot of these are currently labeled waste. So the reverse supply chain, if you look at the reverse supply chain of scrap or waste, is very complicated. It it goes trans-border. Uh, the movement of goods trans-border when it's labeled waste is very difficult. It's very paper-based. So I think digitization, track and trace technology is going to help uh, make that reverse supply chain easier to flow, which means you get more material back, which means you can recycle, put it back into new products. Thank you. We are now at the time of taking questions from the audience. Uh, we should have a, yes, a microphone coming and we'll need... Anyone? <laughs> Nobody is daring. Uh, perhaps uh, to bridge the time until somebody is uh, voting. Uh, um, building on that, what you said, Kunal, uh, we are recycling magnets in the meantime. So we are the, one of the first companies in the, in the world doing that. So we are regenerating magnet powder, collecting old magnets extracting them from machines and motors and making new magnets for new pumps. So that is, uh, in, in as such, where you're still using rare earth then, but it's in a circle now. So no new rare, rare earth needs to be extracted from the world. So that's just one example of uh, what, what we do in this case as well. And I uh, support that idea very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a... There was a ah, question yeah, from Lake. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hello. So I'd like to ask uh, the different uh, stakeholders around the table, what is the biggest challenge you believe you will have to fix as a company to be successful in your uh, sustainability journey? What is the biggest challenge uh, if you had to pick one? Yeah. That's a big question. No, a Thank you, question. Perhaps. First, uh, I, I, I can start if you want. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that... Um, One of the most important uh, condition is the engagement of people, um, the, the the adequate sponsorship of the executives, uh, the adequate uh, human resources, and coherent organizational models 
are a condition for the success of a digitalization process, of an automation process, of the introduction of, and diffusion of technology in our corporation. So, people, change management. If I may the, um, yeah. continue, then I think it's uh, at the end of the day, the technology is all there. All the solutions are there. Scalability is the big issue. How quickly can we do scale the solutions? And then we get into complex structures. Um, let's say we're with different interests in the in the chain up to the to the market. I would say uh, because then that is typically where it uh, is so difficult. Let's say because the the one party has interest on the lowest price, the other party has interest on that and this and that, and different interests in the chain block the the, the speedy scalability of uh, sustainable solutions. So how do I align a, a full ecosystem towards yes. a, a same goal? That's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll add. I think. Beyond that, I think the world is very used to the old way of doing business, which is, um, and what I'm trying to say is sustainability, sustainable businesses are very profitable, can be very profitable, and we all understand because we are in it day to day, but it's still very hard to explain how to change your current business model to, let's say, a circular business model or a sustainable business model and still show profitability. So it is there, it's just how you talk, the language is very difficult. Um, so it's very easy to talk about. It's very hard to implement. And how do you implement it? How do you both get internal buy-in and explain it to your customers? As in, this is not just a, a checkbox exercise. This is actually good for your business. Cut costs gets you more revenue. It's catching on, but there's more work to do there. And to build on something different, I think for us, one of the biggest concerns is the energy availability, meaning the renewable energy that we will need from the grid, which has to develop uh, and to be there on time. Otherwise, we will have new assets that we cannot run because there is not the right energy to produce. So that's a key concern. Well, uh, so first of all, thank you all for a very insightful conversation from different perspectives. So circularity is a systemic change. My question is related to how are you leveraging partnerships upstream and downstream to influence and enable Uh, the whole systemic change required for uh, a circular economy? Well, can I, can I start? Because I'm triggered by the partnership thing. <laughs> you can start and that will probably be the last question because I have a red blinking time. Yeah, that's there, but, but the yeah. timing is wrong, so uh, the question is too important. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the partnership, the reason I'm sitting here is exactly that. That we, Bilo and uh, Schneider, have a partnership in different areas. And one of that is not totally circularity, but it's uh, a total new business for all of us. It's the green hydrogen production. So we're, we're tapping a new field of a decentralized uh, hydrogen generation. And we're just stumbling in and uh, seeing how far we get. So that might be uh, one of the, the nice examples in, in, in that respect in terms of partnerships and leveraging that. Yeah. But my colleagues might have different uh, ideas. But, um, I think that... Um Integrated water cycle industry is um, uh, circular by definition. We we have captation of water um, and uh, we um, treat wastewater. Uh, I think that uh, we can uh, integrate our, our value chain uh, after the treatment with the reuse of treated water. Um, today, uh, the percentage of uh, reused in agriculture, um, wastewater uh, treated is uh, 4%, and uh, we estimate there is a potential uh, to arrive to 30%. Uh, we are at 26%, so we are uh, at a good level. But this is, uh, the, I think, the, the main partnership is with agriculture uh, for the use of treated wastewater in our industry. Very um I'll just mention, so if you take the use case of uh, batteries for electrification, and if you imagine a fully circular value chain, our view is it can only happen through partnership and collaboration because it goes all the way from mining or collecting used batteries to chemical processing to very difficult specialty chemicals to getting into actual batteries to cars to potentially second life use of those batteries to remanufacturing, repair. So no one company can do all of it. Our approach is 
effectively we look at it as a platform business and we are curating this circularity platform and you invite everyone to join so as an example we have partnerships with battery recycling companies we have invested in some we have a partnership with a company a startup that repurposes used batteries um we have several publicly announced partnerships with OEMs and gigafactories uh and chemical manufacturers lithium refiners so for us it's about curating a platform of you know capable and like-minded partners from each part of the value chain and having sort of a free open flow of information communication uh so that you can actually close because it's not one loop when you are doing circularity there are many loops there's reuse recycling repurposing remanufact there's many hours no one company can do all of it but uh you all have to communicate and work together so um, i don't see it happening without partnership and collaboration and additionally if we look at it from a, an investment side our customers expect us to make massive investments for what we'll be doing but we also expect our own suppliers who have a very high scope three so we, we expect our own suppliers to do the right investment on time for us so this does not work if you have a spot relationship so you need to have to build some partnerships up front and uh, and downstream and i do realize we are sitting next to the connect <laughs> logo here so i can't resist that uh, to highlight that uh, to run to operate those partnership uh between different industries between different value chain player exchanging data on an open platform is actually one driver to to make it real and that's actually connect so right it well, we were granted additional minute i think is because the topic is so uh exciting right uh, so we actually can take another question if you have Yes. Uh hello. So I just would like to take the next step of a previous questions. It was about hydrogen. And uh it was very short the answer but very interesting and I presume uh for instance for ArcelorMittal you could uh, maybe explain more about your project. Please. Yes, sure. Um today we use coal which has uh, two benefits at the same time it melts the iron the ore and it reduces the iron meaning take away the oxygen that's why you you produce CO2 at the end tomorrow we will use different technology that will use hydrogen instead of uh, instead of coal so instead of producing CO2 you produce H2O or water or something um so hydrogen is the key lever for our transformation but as i mentioned before we need it and that's the key concern to we in one plant like we have in Dakar again each of plant we will we'll need roughly 1 gigawatt uh, installed capacity of electrolysis today the biggest plant on earth has 200 megawatt so it's five times the biggest that exists on earth that we will we'll need in each of our installations so that's a very big challenge for the transformation but the the solution the technical solution is there natural hydrogen in the floor in the ground uh, well whatever the color of hydrogen we need it in massive quantities and very shortly so uh we, we don't know how much there is in the ground available who will get it and when so that's we have to look at all the sources for us hydrogen being produced from nuclear power from renewable electricity or from uh, from the ground as long as it's uh, kind of uh, Uh, renewable hydrogen uh, lo low carbon hydrogen is fine maybe following up on your hydrogen question uh, i think we well yeah. you, you could share on uh, what uh, you are doing which is uh, hydrogen but producing green hydrogen as part of uh, a local microgrid i would say yes uh, it's basically uh, to to based on the number what uh, stefan uh, said is uh, the power plant is a, i would say a mid-sized plant for mid-sized companies for industrial operation you could say um but not necessarily only industrial operations we also do solutions for an airport for emergency power etc so there are many different um uh models let's say being thought of right now but it's factor 1000 smaller than that what he needs so we are probably going into the area of one maximum one megawatt probably two megawatts this is not sure and below many pretty much below 
But basically what we do is uh, we use uh, PV systems and the so green uh, regenerated energy, basically, which is, uh, let's say, not needed at a certain moment. For example, on the weekend or when you have a company uh, holiday or etc. And then we generate green hydrogen and then we use it back via a fuel cell and power, uh, let's say, give power to the to the factory again. However, uh, one of the aspects also is that we use the thermal energy, which is also in there, because the overall efficiency of that system is then quite good if, if you use the thermal energy also for heating the factory or cooling it. That, that, that depends very much then, yeah. Waste, he, uh, waste heat uh, recovery. Yes, exactly. That's the name. Ex ex exactly, as well. It's, it's one of the many opportunities. It's also uh, a logistic company, for example, is having a lot of PV systems on the roof. They don't need the power, but the idea there is that at the end of the day, we use then the hydrogen directly for the trucks um, to, to move down them then. And, and there are many, many aspects how you could use the energy. But the so, thing is, the key thing is that we have, uh, at least uh, I know that pretty well from Germany, but I'm 100% sure also in the rest of Europe, we even have too much of green energy at certain moments. In Germany, 3,000 hours a year. And we don't use that. So it's, we, we need to find solutions and it's a kind of a storage solution what you then offer. Yeah. Yep. And whatever the scale is, like in water, you know, every drop counts. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.